This is an overview of your culminating activity, your major project, uh, rubric and expectations. So you will find the rubric and also this outline in the contents section. However, it's important to go over what is necessary to be included. So uh, these are not necessarily titles that you need in your project, but these are components that are, will be uh, assessed in one way or another throughout. So the major components here, um, of course your problem and your hypothesis are important, but the summary of the data collection, you need to have a method that uh, creates unbiased data. And so you have data that you can actually use, generate some valid conclusions from. So include a copy of your survey and also a summary of your sampling method. And then we get into the presentation of the data that you find. So the charts and tables should be presented and you should have a variety of them used. Uh, we'll get into in a, in a moment what uh, constitutes too much or too little in terms of displaying the data that you have. Uh, there should also be one variable data analysis two variable data analysis, which is primarily regressions. And then also based on that analysis, you should have some qualitative remarks associated with all your charts and your graphs. And I'll show you what I mean by qualitative remarks in a little bit when we go in more detail. Probability analysis as well should be included. So you should be using the binomial theorem to generate probability questions and answers, uh, as well as normal distribution. So using Z scores to calculate certain values. Uh, lastly, of course, you need to have a conclusion which should summarize all of your results. It should relate back to your problem or your thesis statement. And it should also generalize, uh, hopefully if you have that unbiased data that you collected, uh, generalize to apply to the larger population. And lastly, include your references that you have. So we go into a little bit of detail about what's involved here. There are components of the rubric and I've included only levels four to level one. Uh, of course, it is possible to achieve below level one, but that's not something we, we aim for, obviously. So um, for the first component here, 10 points, uh, out of a total of 70 in the project for the validity of it, the thesis statement, the problem, and the data collection method. So as I said, you need to have your survey included in your presentation. However, in order for this to achieve, a, you know, for you to achieve a level four, you need to be able to have a problem that is allowing you to analyze it thoroughly. And so if you submitted your project proposal to me, I may have indicated to you that your problem did not necessarily allow you to analyze anything in depth. So it may have been a pretty simple solution to your problem, and so you could have tweaked that problem to make sure it's one that allows you to analyze it thoroughly. The hypothesis should, of course, relate to that. And then lastly, the data collection method should be completely unbiased and carried out correctly in order to achieve a level four. So as you move down here, a level three, if you conduct data collection online, um, you would try to avoid as much bias as possible, but of course it's still a voluntary survey that you're ultimately um, sending out. And so that kind of sits you into a level three if you do it online, but do it well. And then as you move below here, you can tell there's some bias involved. And then if there's, you know, a lot of bias and you could have improved that in many ways, then you sit to the level one category. So if you consider the three examples that were uh, illustrated for level four, three, and two, uh, of course, not every component within those projects is sitting at a level four or a level three or a level two. But in terms of the first component here for the data collection method, the BMI analysis does illustrate an example of uh, a level four data collection method. And so if you look over what's been done here, <clears throat> in this example, it's pretty close to a level four. It might be a level four minus because it still was, um, some of it was collected online. Uh, but in this case, uh, the high school is set up into different strata, and so a stratified random sample was used, and an appropriate number of each were actually conducted. So pardon me, this was not done online, and so in fact this does fit into a level four category because this student went to a high school, uh, in particular it was their old high school, but it could be any high school in your case, or a mall, or any other area. And of course, a certain number of males and females from each grade were chosen. And so if you look at the way that that's explained, of course, in great detail, um, how each of those students were polled. The only thing that's missing here is how were those particular students? So when it says a uh, simple random sample in the front hall, how do you actually randomly pick people? Because it's not as easy to just say, I'm going to randomly choose the people that we see because that's not entirely random. So in this case, you might want to choose a systematic way of saying, if I need 11 male grade nines, I'll choose every third one that I see. Or if I take a, a few surveys and collect them, then I'll only use data from that third, every third survey that I have. So it's important to detail exactly how you are going to be analyzing or collecting random data, because it's not as easy as just saying, I will randomly choose people.
Nonetheless, that does fit into a category uh, of level four. And as we move down, this is from the example uh, dealing with musical analysis. And this particular example here, this outlines an online survey that was attempted to remove the bias. So this is an example of an online survey, which many of you may see like you have to do if you don't have access to anything else. But if this is the case, you can still achieve a high level three, uh, but it's important you still identify that how are you survey surveying um, the people that you, you get information from online. So you may obviously have voluntary data being um, sent your way, but you can still choose which people um, to kind of take responses from. So once again, you could still do a stratified random sample, you can do a cluster sample, uh, or you can randomly take selections from those people that have responded to your survey. And then lastly, if you look at the project on driving, um, that is fitting into a level two or a level one. Uh, there's not much detail involved um, as to how the data was actually uh, acquired, um, and certainly it was still done online as well, so that fits below that level three category. Now moving on to the second component of the rubric, we have the um, 10 marks for a knowledge and understanding, which is just how you present the tables and charts from your survey. So I just want to point out that repetition, you want to try to avoid creating a table or a chart for every single uh, column, every single question, and so on that you've asked in your survey. So try not to be repetitive. Instead, you want to, of course, use a variety of charts and tables to achieve a level four, but they need to clearly relate to the problem and the hypothesis. So if you had some questions on your survey, and this happens that don't necessarily directly relate or are not going to be used for the analysis, then you don't need to include them in a summary of your data. So for creating charts and tables, keep that in mind. You don't want to have uh, 10, 20, 30, even though it may be a variety of charts and a variety of tables, displayed just to summarize your survey results. Okay, and there are a few examples that you may see um, out of the level two, three, and four that are posted that do illustrate that there are, you know, when you get into the 100, 110 slide range in your final project, uh, you have to start to, to think, you know, do I have some information here that doesn't necessarily add any value or add anything to my analysis of my problem or my thesis statement? Now for 15 marks, uh, this is where we get into the analysis of the one variable and the two variable data. So obviously a large component of your project, and when you think of the data analysis final project, of course what comes to mind is one variable and two variable data. So regressions, standard deviation, mean, median, mode, and so on. So in order to, to reach a level four in this, you want to be able to apply those methods to both your primary data and your secondary data. So sometimes you may have graphs already created. You may have variables already created, for instance, <clears throat> the mean or the standard deviation of, a, of secondary data, and that's absolutely fine. But you do want to absolutely take your first, uh, your primary data, and apply some of those methods to that, and then also analyze the secondary data as well. So clearly you're going to have some regression comparing the two, um, possibly even between variables of the, uh, the secondary data, and so that's something that you'll have to create on your own. Now, the regressions should relate directly to the problem and the hypothesis, and there are a couple of key things to keep in mind when you do the regressions. So a couple of tips are, first of all, make sure your graphs are labeled. It is very important because, of course, even if you do a, a great regression, if the graph's not labeled, unfortunately it's difficult for me or anyone else to figure out what exactly is being compared. So here, in this example, we have regression taking place, and there is nothing indicating what the x-axis variable is. And maybe male and female here identified between the blue and the red points on the scatter plot, but nothing beyond that. So that's first and foremost, make sure it's labeled. Also, and this relates back to your data collection method, but you want to make sure you have enough data points to actually draw some conclusions from your regressions. So in this case, there are only five data points. It's likely any conclusion you draw will not be valid or be able to apply to a general population when you're only taking a sample size of five individuals or five items. So number one, make sure the graphs are labeled. Before that, make sure you get some data, collect enough so that you can have some reasonable regressions taking place. Uh, number two, make sure the values have meaning. So there is an example here as well where we've got from the music study, and this was uh, 
you know, a level three for overall. But what you'll notice is if you look at this regression in particular is that along the x-axis, the music medium has been given a value from zero to eight. And that simply represents the type of medium that's used. Now, you have to think to yourself if you've quantified uh, a qualitative variable, like in this case, what uh, music medium do you have experience with? CDs, DVDs, MP3, so on. Ask yourself, can those items be moved around? For instance, could I take the MP3 player, which may have been labeled as a 5? Could I move it over here and label it as a 1? And does that have any effect on my data? Well, clearly in the regression it would have an effect because it takes the point, for instance, maybe if I take 6 as an example, it takes that point and moves it all the way upward to the left, and now maybe a little bit out of place. If I take the point here at 7 and I move it down all the way to the left at 0, well now it looks like I can almost have an exponential regression. So when you can take those values that you've assigned to qualitative variables, qualities, and interchange them without affecting uh, you know, the results that you've obtained, that's something that you don't want to apply a regression on. Okay, so. The alternative here is to make sure that the variables that you are comparing, and in the simplest sense, it could be something like, uh, you know, age and income, that you can't just move them around. And so, in this case, if we consider the study that uh, looked at BMI and how the time spent online or the time spent with phones affected that, now we've got a time per week that was spent with a particular tool. In this case, it was on electronics in general. Then we've got the BMI of those particular individuals as well. So we can see here that these two variables are, of course, in this case, uh, you know, the time and BMI are both continuous, but they're most importantly uh, quantitative variables. And so they haven't been, uh, they're not just numbers that have been assigned to different quantities, colors, for instance, or interests that can be interchanged. Now, the last thing that should be pointed out here is that although this does achieve uh, you know, it's a pretty good regression in terms of meeting those first two tips. You want to try to use open-ended questions when you're um, posing your survey questions. And the reason for this is because when you look at the regression that's generated from closed-ended questions, you tend to get this separation within the columns. Now, in this case, it's unavoidable because you're asking someone how much, how many hours per week they're spending using electronics. It's a good idea to give them a range in that case. Uh, when you have questions that people know the exact values for automatically, and in this case, BMI can be calculated exactly. Age, for instance, is one where you want to leave it open-ended because you want to be able to have people say 32, 18, 16, 17, as opposed to lumping them into five-year categories. So try to keep the questions open-ended when possible. If you're asking them for something like a yearly salary or a weekly salary, in that case, you want to try to keep that closed-ended because sometimes people take a while to consider what their salary is. They may not have an exact number, but if you illustrate some ranges, for instance, 0 to 20,000, 20 to 40, 40 to 60 for a yearly salary, they'll be able to easily scan through that and identify their range. So you want to consider, uh, you know, try to use open-ended questions when possible, but if you're asking questions where it might take a little bit of thought, then you might want to increase, uh, or pardon me, introduce those categories and closed-ended options for the user uh, or the respondents to select in the survey. So the regressions are key here, but you should also include, of course, an analysis of standard deviation, mean, which will be included further when you do your, uh, you know, your normal analysis, but also interquartile range, the range, and so on. And if you can include percentiles as well, now you can get into a little bit of a different analysis based on, uh, you know, some of the one variable data. Now, ten marks are also for the remarks that you make based on the charts. And the graphs that you have. So anytime you include a regression or you, pardon me, include a, you know, a bar graph or a histogram, you should be talking about what that's showing. Now the important part here, it's very easy to look at a bar graph or a histogram and say, well, this item has the most. There are 12 of them, right? There are 13 males that uh, prefer Pepsi over Coke, uh, and there are 14 females that prefer the same thing. That's very easy to say, but it's also very easy to see from the graph. So the important part for the analysis is, are you talking qualitatively? That means, can you take the 
numerical information that's been displayed.